everybody. Welcome to the Truth Will Set You Free show. I'm your host, Linda Diane Watley. And this show is brought to you by TOB TV and the Liberty Beacon Project. I have a very special guest today. You know I love my guests. Dr. Clabber Bignon, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Really? Yes, <laughs> that works. Okay. He is a relationship expert. He guarantees you can get to marriage. And the things that he have to share is challenging because I am a single lady. So when I read his book, tell us the name of your book. More than a great partner, how to find and keep the right mate. Yes, I read that book and I have a lot of questions or conversation. Okay. Okay. First, I want to know more about you before we talk about the book. Tell us a little bit about you, where you from, you know, how you end up with Christianity, you know, different things like that. Oh, okay, I am uh, originally from Cameroon in Africa. I'm a Christian. I'm a father of four children. And especially I'm author of the book uh, we just mentioned, More Than a Great Partner, How to Find and Keep the Right Mate. So I've been married to the right mate. And of course, you're going to ask me, how do I know she's the right mate? I've been married to the right mate for 13 years now. Happily married, I must say. And I must say also that everybody can find the right mate if you play by the rules. The rules? Yes, because there are some rules. There's a reason why some people find the right mate and why others do not find the right mate. The rules, are these universal rules or where did you base these rules from? Well, we have to define what is the right mate first. Now, I asked a question, that question to many people, and I heard answer like, uh, the right mate is someone who can take care of me. The right mate is someone who can provide for me. The right mate is someone I can feel uh, comfortable with and spend the rest of my time with. Now, those definitions are good, but they are all subjective because someone can be, make you feel good today and tomorrow be a completely jerk in your eyes. So my definition of the remedy is the best possible partner you could ever find and with whom you can have a fulfilling, loving, and lasting relationship. Now, you can find the best possible partner unless you know all of the possibilities. So it comes down to this. Only God can find the right mate and he will be happy to provide a right mate for whoever plays by his rules. So that's where I came up with the rules. You said God. Yes. You know, uh, many people believe that there's a God, right? and that, that God created the universe and everything. And the same God came up with the idea of marriage. So it means that he knows best how to make it work, and especially he knows who we should marry. He knows best who should marry. Now, you can look at the alternative. The alternative is you go by yourself, you date, and is a disaster. Just look at the statistic. 50% of people end up in divorce, right? Now, if you add those 50%, those that do not divorce, although they are unhappy, you have about 85 to 90% of being wrong when you do it your own way. So I believe uh, the best, uh, the safest way, the only safe way is to do it through that. And the good news is, is willing to help whoever plays by his rules. You also said dating is a waste of time? Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, of course, that will shock some people. Now, dating is a stage of relationship where two people meet to try to figure out each other, to know if they're compatible. Now, the first thing is dating doesn't lead you to the right mate. Absolutely not. Let me give you a study that was conducted by the Rosie Project. Now, this is what they say. They say before the average woman find the man of her dream, she got to kiss 50 men, enjoy two long-term relationships, have her heart broken twice before, suffer four disaster dates, be stood up once, have been in love twice, leave one ex-partner, had four one next ten. Now, when you put this together, it's a long, long time. People date for decades before settling down with someone they believe is suitable mate. Yeah, so it, it, it's a waste of time. Going through God is still the shortest way to find the right mate. And not only that, dating cause emotional damage. You can't go through this, being stood once, going through broken relationship after broken relationship and not damage your soul. A study was conducted, social scientists found that among black American, African-American women who want to get married, there are some challenges that they face in the attempt to establish a long-term relationship. Some of those challenges are fear of divorce, difficulty trusting, and pain from past relationship. Now, where do they get those feelings? They get those feelings through the broken relationship they've been through dating all of the time. So dating doesn't work. And you also said intimacy is is not a good idea because it has a lot of damage too. So what is the difference from dating and intimacy? Okay, well, the difference is, well, you know what? Dating in principle and in essence is meeting people casually. But you know, sometimes it goes up to intimacy. Now, it hurts more when you engage in intimacy with someone who's going to let you down. You don't want to go that road because by going that road, you remove God from the equation. You also said that sex is a big problem, that it makes things messy. What do you mean by that? Yeah, well, you know, uh, the only or the safest setting that God provided for sex is within marriage. Outside marriage, let's look at sex as fire in your house. Now, when the fire is on the fireplace, it's good. It keeps the, keep the, the house warm. But when you take that fire and you put on the carpet, then the whole house can go into mess. So that's exactly the picture of sex in a relationship. Because when you engage in sex, you are actually getting married. In God's eyes, you are married. So it won't make sense to come back to God to say, well, you know what? I've been sleeping with this person, but I would like you to find the right mate. It's not going to work. So either you go to God and play by his rules, or you try on your own and mess things up. I mean, just look around. Look at what's happened in relationship around in the world. It's a big disaster. To the point where some people don't even believe in marriage anymore. Yet marriage is a beautiful thing. I can tell you that. You also said people think that they can figure out if this is the right person for them if they cohabitate. But you said that is more damaging than doing that before marriage. Yes, people try to figure out the right mate by cohabiting, right? They believe that by leaving with someone, they can see how to behave. They can kind of mimic 
married before the actual marriage. Now, dating or living with someone only give you one picture at a time of a relationship. You know, it can look good for two years or three years, and eventually after 10 years, the relationship will last. So what you need here is someone who has the overall view of the whole thing. Only God knows from the beginning to the end. Only God knows that the guy who is treating you like a queen today is going to cheat on you five years or 20 years from now. Or the girls that honor you today are going to let you down 10 years from now when you lose your job or something happens. So in that sense, it really doesn't help you to stay with someone to try to figure out people. Remember, marriage was God's idea. He knows best how to make it work. And he said, dating and having sex before marriage is not a good idea. So, okay, if you talked about doing it God's way, would you say the same thing apply for the woman as it apply for the man in their um, quest for this companion? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. It's the same identical process. Absolutely the same identical process, yeah. Uh, God set the rules for everyone. Although the Bible actually says that houses and riches a man can inherit from his parent but a good wife the right mate i'm paraphrasing the right mate is a gift from god so when the bible says man a good man or a good woman actually means both sex however he takes it what did you just say what i'm saying that the bible quote Mention a man, say that a man can inherit houses or riches from his parents, but a good wife comes from God. So God actually means a man and a woman in that sense. A woman can inherit riches and material um, goods from, his, from her parents, but a good man or the right man is a gift from God. So it applies to both. So do you feel like a woman can recognize that this is the man for her chosen by God before the man realizes it or do the man, because it's my understanding that a man find it for good wife. So wouldn't he be the one to confirm it more so than the woman when she recognizes it? Yeah. Either one of them can confirm, depending on how close, whoever is closer to God. I have a friend uh, that was, she's been married for, she was married for 18 years. She had four kids and uh, she wound up divorcing because when she got married, when she wasn't a Christian, so it didn't work out. So after her divorce, she went back to God and she said, well, Lord, Father, I need another husband. And she gave God the exact description of her husband. She said, he has to be about my age. She was about 40 years old. He should not have children. Never married before. That was preferences. God doesn't have anything wrong about people who've been married before. So she said, never been married before. And he should belong to a particular cultural group she, she liked. So now, the man, her, her husband, I mean, he became her husband later on, did not have any idea what was happening. She was the one who identified, recognized him, and the one to get him married. So a woman, like a man, can be the one to identify the right date. Like for you, how did those steps take you to your wife? Oh, well, uh, well, let me maybe give you the rules, the step anybody can follow. Is it okay? Sure. Okay, now, the first step, there are five rules or five principles by which God will show you the right way. 
Now, what I mean by the rules? The first is you got to belong to God's family. It's just common sense, right? Because when you go to God and you say, I want a good woman and I want a good husband, you are in essence asking God to find one of his own children. So it makes sense that you belong to God's family first. So how you do that? Well, by giving your life to Jesus Christ. Now, the second principle is you have to live a holy life. Now, I, I don't mean by holy life you have to be sinless because nobody is. What I mean by holy life is you have to live a, house, a life with reverence from God and power by the Holy Spirit to do the will of God. For instance, having a boyfriend or a girlfriend is not exactly a holy life. Now, many people may not like it, but it's not a holy life. And maybe later I can explain why God doesn't want it to happen that way. The third principle is you got to engage God. You got to ask. You say, ask and it will be given to you. So, by the way, by asking, God gives you the opportunity to tell you what kind of person you like. So you can say, I want a tall man. I want a man who makes me laugh. I want a man who loves children. I want a woman beautiful, light skin. God allow you to say those things. So where do you say those things? Is when you're engaging God in prayer. The fourth principle by which you should operate in order to find the right mate is you got to see the right mate through God's eyes. Because in God's eyes, the right mate is not necessarily the popular bachelor, the most beautiful girl, uh, the most handsome man, and the man who has the job, the look, and the money. God's look at the heart first. A beautiful heart is the most important to God. Of course, God has in mind your base, your financial security, but he looks at the heart. And this is one of the reasons why so many women, including Christians, are still single. Because the thing that God's idea of the right mate is to, to match them with people of the same social and professional status or financial status. God doesn't see things that way. By the way, do you know that God used many well-off women to bless men that do not have much? Because many of our sisters have a tendency to believe that this man should be a blessing. He should come and provide for me. And God said, well, you can be a blessing to him too. If you are well off, you can be a blessing to him. Why not? So seeing the right mate through God's eyes is the fourth principle. And the last principle is you should give God the time to change you. Why? Because a good relationship only happens when it involves two good people. What I call two lambs opposed to two wolves. So most relationships involve two wolves or a lamb and a wolf. It doesn't work. It has to involve two lambs. Two lambs, I mean by lambs, people with the character of Jesus, gentleness, humility, integrity, compassion, kindness, love. Now, the problem is we are not born that way. And you don't become that way overnight after becoming a Christian. That's why God has to prepare you for a relationship. You have to give him time and participate in that preparation. So you follow those four, five principles. There's no reason why God's not going to give you the right name. And by the way, and as, like I said in the group, God doesn't face a deficit of good men, unlike what many women believe. God doesn't scratch his head wondering, where am I going to find those men? He know, by the way, he knows your husband even before you start praying. He knows his name. He's God. He knows everything. I mean, it's so easy to do it with God. He's so, he's, he's so comfortable. He's so sure. He's so... 
appeasing to do with God instead of trying with people, dating, up and down. So what really have you on fire about letting everybody know this because you weren't always going by those principles. So what really, because you ended up with your companion, is that why you feel that this is exactly the way this is supposed to be done? Yeah, but it was actually a, a revelation. Now, it, it sounds like a big word, but that's the truth. When uh, I came to the U.S. and uh, in the foreign land, you know, we faced challenges and I found myself alone and very vulnerable. So I threw myself in the hands of God. So from that point, no girlfriend, nothing like that. So I had to stay by myself. Of course, after a moment, I started praying, asking God to give me a wife. And God said this, well, if you want to write me, you're going to do it by my, my way. So his way is I stay by myself for five years. No girlfriend, just by myself, spending time with God. No, I'm not saying that was easy and you know, I like it, but that's the way God did. So God, that's where God starts showing me why he was having me wait. Now, one of the things he says is that as a man, you did not value women. I mean, this is one of the things. He said, you don't value women, right? You know, you have this girl, you don't want her, you get another girl. And God said, well, you know, by spending time by yourself, cooking your own food, you're going to get an appreciation of the wife I'm going to bring to your life. So this is one of the things that God did to me. And I had to win. Now, at one point, I became tired and frustrated, you know, I would go to church during winter and I would see people leaving, going back, uh, as couple home. And then I would go by myself and stay in my little apartment. So at that point, God uh, connected me to another guy who was single and we became friends and we would go home, we would go home my apartment, spend time watching movies and, and things like that. So for some people, God has to discipline you, for instance, to be sexually pure. If you can stay sexually pure by yourself, you can definitely stay sexually, remain faithful to your wife. Now, without preparation, you can't make it because you are too raw. You are not ready. God has to break you. God has to remove your selfishness. God has to remove your ego. God has to clean you of your arrogance, of your pride and your unforgiveness. All of these things that destroy relationship before he brings that person to you. You know, I have heard a person that's really consumed in their relationship with God. And when it comes to relating to a female, he said he would never put a female before God. So is that the, the way to go? Yeah, no, that may sound radical, but that is actually for the good of his wife. Why? Because unlike what many people believe, there is nothing good in us. No much. Our goodness comes from flows, actually, from the love of God. So the more God you have in you, the more you have love to give to your wife. Think about it. None of us can really love his wife the way God intends by himself. No woman can really submit to her husband the way God intends by her own power. So the more you are full of God, the more you have God inside you, the more you are beautiful and the more you can love your wife. That's why he said that he should put God first. That's what God called his first love. God is our first love. Now, just think about it. I think I remember uh, Dr. Charles Stanley. He mentioned that for a week, he's a pastor. He refrained from spending time with God just to see what's going to happen. So he said by the end of the week, he lost his confidence, he lost his quietness, he lost his peace. He became restless. Why? Because he had distanced himself from God. 
the same thing happened in the couple. There's a balance between the flesh and the spirit. The spirit is our good side, love, integrity, forgiveness, um, humility. The flesh is our self, our pride, and our arrogance and forgiveness. So the more you spend time with God, the more the spirit takes over you, empower you, and keep your flesh in check. The more you distance yourself from God, the more the flesh side takes over you. Let me tell you something, if you allow me. One of the keys for men to become faithful, to stay sexually pure and to be, and stay faithful to his wife. Your will plays a role, but the most important things you should do is spending time with God. The more time you spend with God, the more you are filled his spirit with his spirit, and the less likely you will be to cheat on your wife. You won't even feel the desire because you are so full of God. Now, the less you spend time with God, the more your fleshy desire take over, you know, the desire of the flesh, and you start looking at other women. So it's a spiritual thing. But woman, by the way, I say in the book that. Women should not worry about her husband when he starts coming late. She should worry once she knows that his relationship with God has been has gotten low. So God is your best guarantee if you want to keep your marriage. So, you know, like I have heard <clears throat> that a lot of black men, I don't know about white men, how they feel about women but a lot of black men feel that black women can't be told anything even in the church they say that the woman can't be told anything and she's obstinate so where do you come together if you already have this precondition of a perspective of a person now, um, when you look for the right maid, you go to God. It's a one-to-one -one thing. You go to God and you say, God, Father, I need a wife. Right. And usually God will say, okay, I will find your wife, but you know what? I need to do some work on you first. So he will have you sat on the side, not do anything. Now, eventually, eventually, God might lead you into some difficult situation. For instance, if you are too full of you, you are too proud of your success, God might make you lose your job, right? Because that will humble you, because that will destroy uh, the power of money in your life. He might take you job, he might keep you job for a couple of years just to change you. Now, so why he's doing that on you, he is doing that on the girl he has meant for you. So what God does while you're waiting is that he changes your mindset, the way you see relationship, the way you, you evaluate, you assess people, the way you see women. He changes that. He transforms a wolf that is in you into a lamb. And believe me, that comes with some pain. So, your job as a husband or wife seeker is to go to God and let God handle the other person. And when God brings that person to your life, should be ready. Now, I didn't say it should be perfect. I'm saying that should be ready for you because there's still some growth to happen as a couple. She's going to offend you. She's going to disappoint you. You're going to offend her. You're going to disappoint her. But that's how you grow into the image of Jesus Christ. Because those experiences and these disappointments forge a character of forgiveness, a character of patience, a character of compassion that God wants to have in order to become like Jesus Christ. So you're saying, okay, there's a couple, just for an example, they have been cohabitating for seven years. They're accumulating wealth. 
they're healthy, they're there for each other's children, but they're not married. You're saying that that's not realistic? Well, I would say that is risky because at any time he can collapse, right? He can, he can, the man can fall in love with some other woman, he can cheat. Uh, the same can happen to a woman. It's very risky, it's really a shaky ground. What they should do is, first of all, to commit their life to Jesus Christ. Once they do that, they should abstain from any intimacy and ask God. I mean, either one of them can do that. Usually only one person does that. So that person might find Jesus Christ and realize that the situation I'm in is not pleasing to God. So she should go and say, the Lord, what should I do? And God might say, well, you know what? This man has never been your husband or he is your husband, but you should do it the proper way. You know, meet the pastor, stop all intimacy, go to counseling and get married. So you don't believe the saying that they say that usually people are married spiritually before they are physically? Yes, people are married spiritually, but the problem is when you don't belong to God, you are spiritually dead. You have a soul, you have a, a spirit, but that spirit is dormant. So we mention being married spiritually only when it involves the Holy Spirit. So usually people that uh, get married or get in a relationship outside God's will are connected at two levels. They are connected at the flesh level, meaning that physical level, they are also connected at the soul level, but they are not connected at the spirit level. Now, when you belong to God and you do this the proper way, the connection starts in the spirit. The spirit keeps the relationship grounded. And then you have another connection at the level of the soul where, you know, I like the personality, I like spending time. And then... The physical, the physical connection is the weakest connection. You can fall, I mean, you can see it falls apart anytime and all the time. Now, why is it important to be connected in the spirit? Because someday your wife or your husband is going to disappoint you, right? Disappoint you, and you're going to remember that you know what? This is a covenant. This is not just a joke or because I like this is a covenant. And God is a witness of that covenant. So you will go back to God and say, Lord, quiet my heart, calm my feeling, take away my, take away my anger. That's what the Spirit allows you to navigate the relationship even when the soul level or the physical level are broken. Really, without the Spirit connection, you are on shaky ground. So did you share this, <clears throat> this knowledge and wisdom and principles in your country? I haven't done it yet because uh, I had the revelation after moving to United States. And I plan to do it, uh, not only in my country, but all over the world. So you feel like this is global. It shouldn't just stop with American people. Oh, no, of course not. I mean, I'm talking to American people because, well, I'm the United States at this moment, but this is global. I mean, there's a marriage crisis even in my own country, all over the place. We all need the same knowledge. So have you been able to reach people on a collective level? I mean, have you had like groups of people that you have spoken to and it made a difference like your younger generation of people? Yeah, I've, I've been to churches, many, several churches, I would say, and uh, I spoke and it made sense to people. And uh, actually, I had a, a friend of mine who is, he said when he was getting married, he was looking for a power couple. He had a good job, looking for a woman who had a good job. He found one, they like each other. 
and it didn't work out. So I gave him the copy of the book and we spoke many times over the phone and he said that, you know what, I made a mistake. And this time I'm gonna do it God's way. And it's actually doing it God's way. And one, one of the things he's doing is that when he meets a girl, he doesn't try to date her, he doesn't try to sleep with her. He talks to the girl, he talks to the girl and he prays over her. So a couple of days ago, he mentioned one of the girls he met and uh, she had qualities that he liked. And I said, well, you, you need to pray about her. So he started praying about her. And then he came back to me and said, I see things that show me that this is not the woman God wants me to marry. So he's still searching. He's not married yet, but he's going to do it the right way. So why do you think there are divorces among Christians? Oh, well, many reasons. The first reason, actually, I asked the question. When I was writing the book, I pray. I say, God, talk to me about it. And this is what God told me. He said, many people attending church are not even Christians. A whole lot of people. I'm going to shock you that many people attending churches are not Christian. They go to church because where well, they grew up going to church, because that's the right thing to, to do, because that's the thing to do on Sunday morning. But the heart and the lifestyle doesn't belong to God. Now, that's the first reason. The second reason is that some Christian, true Christian, pick their own mates. They didn't ask God. They went to church or some other uh, social function. They met a girl, beautiful, or a man who seemed handsome man. And they assume that see they like each other and they are both Christian, then that should be the will of God. And they don't go and ask God, should I marry this girl? Is this my husband? So that's why it doesn't work out. Now, it may not work out in that case because there are still a lot of wolves inside them, very little of Jesus inside them, or one of them is not even a Christian. So you have a wolf and a lamb coming together. So that's the second reason. And the third reason, but that one I haven't really witnessed it, is some people may have gotten married within God's principle, but after they got married, they left God outside the relationship. So they, they enjoy each other, but they left God outside. Let me say this. The best, the single most important a couple can do to keep the relationship is to pray together. The single most important thing a couple can do is to read the Bible and pray together. Why? Because that connects you at the spirit level. And that connection is so strong that mother-in-law and father or father-in-law cannot come in between. Let me say, single, it may not make sense, but the single most important Thing a couple can do to remain together is to pray every day together. Because prayer is like a glue. The more you pray, the stronger the glue. Nothing can separate you when you do that. You know, you're married and you're happy. What made you want to just tell the world so that they could get? I mean, what, what is driving you to get this message out? Oh, I remember I was at going to a, a, my friend swelling in, he's an attorney. So we're in the car with uh, my then fiance and the other people. And the conversation shifted to uh, relationships. And there was a particular lady in that uh, car who wanted to get married. She was single, she wanted to get married, but she didn't know how to do it. And I tried to share with her the principle, but I realized that I cannot monopolize the conversation. And I decided where to go and find the book. 
that will help her. I went to a Christian library and I looked for uh, books. I saw several books, good books, but I didn't see a book that would take her where she is and lead her in the process up to how to identify the right mate. And then God, actually, God said, then write a book. So when God said that, I said, well, you know what? Me? Write a book? Write a book? <laughs> I don't have enough knowledge to write a book. So at that point, God did not say anything. And I started thinking about it. And God downloaded the plan of the book, chapter after chapter in my mind. Then as I started writing the book, God started giving me material, material to write the book. And I can tell you on several occasions, I will stop at one chapter. I say, Lord, I don't know what to say. What can I say? How can I explain this to people? And God would take three days without saying anything. And uh, one day, and then he would flow me with ideas and answers to my question. So God actually asked me to write a book. And, and uh, I wrote a book. And I can tell you, he provided the material to write that book. So do you do speaking engagements or are you preaching? Because that's what I was trying to figure out. Are you preaching or are you teaching? Well, what's the difference? Well, preaching is like you delivering Jesus Christ through the message. And you follow through Jesus Christ, everything else falls in place. When you're teaching, you treat, like you said, the principles, you say, oh, teaching you know, a psychological teaching, not a spiritual teaching. So, you know, which one is it? Oh, I do both. Well, in my church, sometimes the pastor let me preach. But when I get invited in other churches, is is teaching because it's about sharing that the message of finding the right mate. And this message is actually, I believe, I don't want to be... Um, to look like I'm getting a big head, but it's a message that God released for people to free them from the bondage of bad relationships. And one of the bondage is many women, many women believe that they can't get married because not just a girl, enough good men. And they will say all good men are already married. And in the book, I say that God doesn't have any problem finding a man to each of his daughters. It's just that his daughters doesn't involve him or they don't play by his rules. There's no deficit, there's no men deficit. So you're concerned about relationships because you see a lot of people don't have a lot of hope to have that right companion. Oh yeah, I, I see that is is heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. And whenever I get a chance and engage them and I will talk to them, some people will listen. And what I realize is that they want a quick solution. So they want a situation where you say, Okay, this is what you do, and by the end of the week, you have a husband. It doesn't work that way. It is a process because even if God will give them a husband at the end of the week, they won't be able to keep him. They will destroy the relationship. That's why in the process, God has to transform you from being like Satan, let's put it this way, to being like Jesus Christ. Because a relationship or marriage only works with Two people like Jesus Christ is just common sense. So basically, you approach the young in the same way you approach the adults? Not necessarily. I approach the young on the dating side because young people want to have fun. They want to enjoy life. So they see some of these principles are restriction, right, that I'm trying to to. to to impose on them not to enjoy life. So I'll show them why it's not going to work. For instance, I will tell the girl that the boyfriend will say that loves you, 
doesn't even know that he doesn't really love you. He believes that he loves you, but he doesn't actually know that he doesn't love you. And I will tell them what eventually going to happen. Like, you're going to have a good time now. You're going to enjoy him. You're going to say all the nice words and do all the nice things. And this is what's going to happen eventually. He's going to get tired of you and he's going to cheat on you because, well, he cannot just control his flesh and you're going to want to cry. And they will say, how do you know that? Well, I say because, well, I went through that already. So that's for young people. For adults, I will show them, because many adults, especially women, face the fear of not being able to find a man. You know, they say that there's seven over 10 women in America, African Americans that are single. Seven over 10 are single. And one uh, physician, she's an African American physician, doctor, one day asked her, uh, doctor, how hard or easy it is for you to find a partner? I didn't say write me, I said a partner. Oh, she said, well, there are 10 people like me for one good man. And she defined a good man as a man, a black man, uh, without, with a good education, with some income, and without kids. And she says, so there are 10 women like me competing, fighting for one man. And she paused for a few seconds and she said, you know what? In truth, there are 20 people like me for one good man. So this is a common thing I, I find with women. And this is one of the barriers, one of the, the, the strongholds I try to bring down when I, when I speak to them. And I tell them why God doesn't face any challenge. By the way, I can tell you, God doesn't face any challenge because of his ability to change people. So when you go to God, you say, Father, I need a husband. So the spirit of God will scan the whole world and pick someone for you. And that person may not even be a Christian at that time. He may not even want to do anything with God. But because you pray, your prayer generates the power that God used to act in his life. So if the person God wants for you, is not a Christian where God might bring some hardship in his life. You know, hardship makes us humble. Like I say, he might lose his job, he might become sick. I mean, he might have, he might go through some kind of hardship to get him interested in the things of God. So, to summarize, God's ability to transform people provide him with an unlimited number of men. God has billions of people. You pray, God pick a man and transform him for you. That's how it works. It's easy. <laughs> Beautifully said. You definitely have a heart for the single soul to have that great partner. If a person wanted to get your book or get in touch with you, how do they do that? Well, uh, my book, on the back of my book, they have uh, put my one of my email address. And they can get in touch with me through my email address. The book can be found on Amazon, or the book can be found on the website of my publisher, which is www.dovechristianpublishers.com. Dove, D-O-V-E, christianpublishers.com. And Clapper, you are on the Truth for Set You Free show. Give us a truth to remember you by. The truth is, there's no way you can succeed in life, in marriage, or in any other area if you do not put God first. But <laughs> put God first, you are always going to succeed. I didn't say that it's going to be easy, going to be pleasant. But at the end, you always succeed. Why? Because God made everything. Love it. <laughs> I really enjoyed everything you shared today. Well, thank you, Linda. It was a pleasure. Thank you for being on our show. You're going to have to come back because I think you're going to be writing another book. 
Yes, definitely. Yes. I'll be happy to. I think you are. And it seemed like to me it's going to be dealing more with the younger people. Thank you. Yeah. I, I believe that. Thank you. And you did a good job on your book. Thank you very much. So you just stay the course, and we look forward to hearing more from you. Thank you, Linda. Take care. Thank you for having me on your show. Take care. Bye-bye.